Thank you all for joining us today and welcome to the fourth webinar in our Divest from the War Machine webinar series, Divesting Universities. Um, this is part of a five week webinar series with Code Pink and World Beyond War. And this webinar is currently being live streamed on YouTube and it will be posted to the World Beyond War YouTube account afterwards. So um, just a reminder, throughout the duration of the call, if you have any questions for our guest speakers, please just send them in the Zoom chat box because we're going to be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar to address all of the questions. So today's webinar will explore the wave of student activism that has led to grassroots divestment campaigns on university campuses all around the world. And divestment is a focused, actionable, and effective organizing technique that enables students to make a global political impact through activism on their campuses. And students across the world are currently organizing to divest their university endowments from various destructive industries that threaten the future of humanity and the planet and university administrations have started responding. And as the fastest growing divestment movement in history with over 100 universities already divested and over $5 trillion taken away from the fossil fuel industry, uh, the fossil fuel divestment movement has proven the power of student activism. And across the world, students are also organizing to divest their endowments from weapons manufacturers and the war machine, private prisons and detention centers, and the occupation of Palestine to demand that their schools are not profiting from companies responsible for climate change, endless war, displacement, and other human rights violations. And these various divestment campaigns all intersect and strengthen each other in their call for a radical revisioning of university endowments to represent student values. So today we are joined by two activists who are going to share their experiences um, with university divestment campaigns and the insight they gained along the way so that we can all learn how to engage in successful divestment campaigns going forward. So first, we are joined by Fee Shroth Dalma. Fee is a student divestment activist from New Haven, Connecticut, who attends Yale University. She is a, um, she's an organizer with the Movement for Yale to divest from fossil fuels and cancel holdings in Puerto Rican debt. And beyond endowment justice, she is also the advocacy and volunteers coordinator for a reproductive justice student organization. She is also the, a staffer at her campus women's center and a member of her local sunrise movement. Welcome Fee and thank you for being on today's webinar. Hello, thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be here and I'm so excited to see all of your faces just full of love and solidarity. This is so great. Awesome. Well, we are also joined by Layla Kanan, an activist based in Portland, Oregon. Layla was part of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement or BDS movement at University of Oregon, and she worked with Students United for Palestinian Equal Rights, or SUPER, to pass a pro-BDS resolution on her campus. And since graduating from the University of Oregon, Layla has hosted a community radio show called One Land, Many Voices, where she interviews other Palestinians and activists and discusses Palestinian current events. Welcome, Layla, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you all. I'm so excited. This is awesome. I obviously love talking about Palestine, so what greater audience to have? <laughs> but yeah, thank you. This is great. Awesome. So now we will be having a facilitated conversation with Fee and Layla to hear more about their experiences organizing for divestment on their campuses. So first of all, 
Could you both share a bit about the divestment campaigns that you are involved with and what are the demands and goals of these campaigns? Yeah, um, I can share a bit about my campaign, the Yale Endowment Justice Coalition, or EJC for short. We have two central demands. We're advocating for our university to divest from fossil fuels and to cancel its holdings in Puerto Rican debt. Um, but in the last couple months, we refocused lots of our energy uh, around the pandemic and organizing resource and wealth sharing from our university to surrounding communities in New Haven. Everything that we fight for falls under the umbrella of endowment justice, and so that broadly encompasses divestment from unethical institutions and practices like fossil fuels, Puerto Rican debt, the prison industrial complex, and predatory lending, but it also involves sustainable and just reinvestment and wealth redistribution. So we've employed a range of methods. We tried to do kind of a top-down collaboration with our university's advisory committee on investor responsibility, and that didn't work very well. Um, so now we've moved on to nonviolent direct action. Um, and I've served as a wellness captain and a rally leader and a song leader, and have helped to facilitate nonviolent direct action training so far. Awesome, thank you, Fee. Yeah, okay, so like Kelsey said, um, I was a part of a group called Super, Students United for, equal, for Palestinian Equal Rights uh, at the University of Oregon. Um, it's an esen essentially an organization that fights for the freedom and justice of Palestinian people who have traditionally been silenced, killed, um, imprisoned, um, and have been living under military occupation since 1948. And although this group does focus on the importance of BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction Israel, it's equally, in my mind, it's equally as important to draw the parallels between struggles for equality all around the world and more specifically in the US. So yes, the goals of super and BDS is to bring much needed attention to the struggles of Palestinians. Personally, personally my goal was to increase the awareness of how Black Lives Matter and how the indigenous sovereignty movement really all connects and all exists in the same storyline. Um, and so, yeah, that, I think that is essentially the goal of Super, BDS, Students for Justice in Palestine, all of it. Wow, well, thank you both so much. Uh, I'm excited to hear more about these campaigns. Um, so, Layla, could you elaborate more on um, how your campaign initially emerged? Yeah, for sure. There's a, it's a long history. So SUPER is actually a subgroup of a larger organization, SJP, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine. And it was, that was established in 1993, which was around the time <clears throat> of the Palestinian intifadas or uprisings. Um, and that started in University of California, Berkeley. Um, and later in 2004, as an offshoot of SJP, BDS was founded as an organization to specifically boycott and divest from Israeli academic and cultural institutions. And as for SUPER, um, it started a bit late on U of O campus. Uh, we started it in 2018, um, but has existed nationally for years and years and years. Um, but SUPER and BDS um, as a general movement has national and international support and is one of the largest pro-Palestinian grassroots movements in the world. Um, and it's gained immense support from students, politicians, academics, really anyone that learns about it probably becomes pro-BDS. Um, and more importantly, it has the support from essentially all Palestinian human rights groups and organizations, Palestinian trade and labor unions, politicians, um, so on and so, but because BDS shines a light on the injustices Palestinians face um, and aims to boycott Israeli organizations, it is faced with a lot of negative pushback um, and people that are pro-BDS often experience a lot of demonization. And I'll get into that later. Awesome, Layla, thank you for sharing more about it with all of us. So Fee, in your divestment campaign at Yale, um, what would you say effective outreach looks like? And um, how do you raise campus awareness around divestment? That's such a good question because raising campus awareness is so vital and the work never stops. You know, you have to raise awareness directly before and after an action and in the lulls between actions. So it just, it really is part of the work. Um, and we found ourselves dealing with a lot of that this year when we had to manage press coverage, 
um, and our media narrative when we disrupted the Harvard Yale football game in November of 2019. Um, and that ended up being quite successful because it resulted in kind of a university, like a nationwide movement and the eventual creation of the College Climate Coalition. But in order for that to happen, we had to have these skills of raising campus awareness. And so I guess to like name some tactics for any of the university students who are watching or who will be watching this recording in the future, uh, some of the tactics that the Endowment Justice Coalition has found especially helpful um, is the teach-in. We are big fans of the teach-in. It's very near and dear to our hearts. Just an interactive lecture style gathering that aims to educate participants about an activist cause and then hopefully to mobilize them from passive supporters into active participants in the movement. We've been holding teach-ins for years since 2018. In 2018, we held our first one that was called Inside Yale's $27 billion. And now they have over $30 billion just to illustrate how much wealth is truly hoarded and how much is accumulating over time. Um, we found that teach-ins are also most successful when they're paired with lots of publicity and lots of canvassing. And I guess that leads me to um, another tactic we use, which is dorm storming. And that's just knocking on students' doors to promote a cause. We love dorm storming. It's typically to promote a specific event like a public rally or a march. Um, and flyers are really helpful. Sign up forms, spreadsheets are highly recommended so that you can get people's contact information and get them involved because ultimately retainment of participants in a demonstration or a direct action is what you need um, to help the campaign continue to gain momentum after that initial because retaining allows the people that you get involved to then raise campus awareness themselves and get their friends to raise campus awareness. And so it just becomes this beautiful positive feedback loop we also constantly organize one-on-one -on -one meetings to get folks involved. We dedicate press liaisons to learning how to represent our movement effectively to the media. Uh, we engage in lots of national and global coordination with other university campaigns. Highly recommend um, Slack as a platform to any university students who need a platform to organize. It's wonderful. Um, and we talk a lot about coalition building, but that honestly deserves its own like whole speech. Um, we also dedicate entire working groups to reaching out to specific groups of people, which I think has been really helpful for effective outreach in the Endowment Justice Coalition. We have an alumni outreach group and a faculty outreach group and a grad student outreach group. Um, and I really would emphasize the importance of reaching out to faculty for university students because lots of them will be allies, maybe ones that you wouldn't expect. Um, after the Harvard Yale game in November, I had a professor who asked about my arrest at the Harvard Yale game and I was a little bit sheepish and I kind of tried to give a palatable answer about how much research we'd done legally and how we knew like all the different repercussions of getting a citation or a misdemeanor and we weighed all the pros and cons really carefully. And he just went, you don't have to explain all that to me. I got arrested in Vietnam War protests and it was a beautiful moment. So it's really good to connect to faculty, to alumni, to everybody that you can and to your neighbors um, in the surrounding town or city if your university has a surrounding town or city. Awesome. Thank you so much, V, for all of that insight into how to navigate campaigning in a campus environment. So, um, Layla, would you be willing to expand more on um, what makes the university environment so unique for activism? Yeah, for sure. Um, so campus activism is a very unique movement, one that is like simultaneously to navigate, sorry, and gain support for um, because students are learning, they're expanding their um, intellectual horizons, but it's also one that gets a lot of pushback depending on what the movement is targeting. Um, this negative portrayal of BDS supporters exists pretty much in every sector, including on university campuses. And in my experience, in my experience, when we were looking for professors to support us, um, Many professors were afraid to support super because they could lose their jobs. Many students were afraid of using their real names in support of BDS because they'd be put on the Canary Mission list, um, which is a list that essentially exists to blacklist people, um, mainly Muslims, mainly brown people. Um, and it prevents them from getting jobs, from traveling, or even in extreme circumstances, it prevents them from living just a normal life. So as you can see, this is a much larger issue than just fighting for Palestinian rights on university campuses. It's, it's about free speech. So when you see, when we see on campuses a place that's supposed to foster free thinking, 
and expression, people being attacked for being pro-BDS or losing their jobs because of it, we know there's a larger force involved in silencing this movement and most student movements on campus, I would say. Um, and in, in the BDS case, it's the Israeli lobby, it's the American politicians that rely on the Israeli lobby to keep them in office and it's corporations that rely on Israeli businesses. And so I think what we can really learn from all of this um, that all divestment groups on campuses, all human rights activism groups around the world are all fighting against the same superpower. I mean, and not necessarily the Israeli lobby, but fighting against the people that allow such superpowers to exist. Um, which again, just brings me back to the same um, important, it's the importance of seeing the parallels between my group versus fees group versus whatever other activism group there is. It's um, that's also a unique part of being a student group on campus is that we can team up with other groups and we can draw the parallels. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to see the larger picture because it does start on, on university campuses, but it, it can grow to be much, much bigger. Thank you, Layla. Those are really excellent points. And um, I'm curious in the campus environment, what are some uh, benefits of coalition building like you're talking about um, with other student groups and divestment campaigns and how do you go about doing that? Um, v, if you want to take this one. Yeah, I'd love to. Layla, you just um, characterized coalition building so beautifully just now and earlier um, and how necessary it is that all different groups that are fighting power structures team up. Um, especially with the fossil fuel divestment movement, it's so necessary because climate justice isn't really climate justice if it's not grounded in anti-racism and in anti-colonialism. And with majority white climate action groups, in my experience, um, Fossil for Yale, which is part of the Endowment Justice Coalition, is one of those. They have a tendency to adopt anti-racist and anti-colonial language with the best of intentions, but then without actually doing the work alongside using that language in their own marches and rallies. And so I think the nature of the Endowment Justice Coalition has been helpful in combating that tendency because it's already a coalition. We're composed of groups with different interests in our divestment demands, um, especially Fossil for Yale, Despierta Boricua, and Prison Divest. But we have many more member groups with varying levels of involvement. And because of that, we're quite self-reflective and self-critical. We have a non-hierarchical non structure uh, which is very useful for any university divestment movement because it means that there are no leadership roles and all working groups and tasks are open to everyone. And so that makes coalition building much easier. It's easier for the group's mission and methods to evolve. And it allows us to self-interrogate without feeling like we're challenging any scary leadership. It also protects against paternalism and corruption and defensiveness in leadership because those leaders don't exist in the first place. And so this year, we engaged in some really complex discussion about how to build coalitions in a way that doesn't burden anti-racist and anti-colonial groups with extra labor, but that does allow our group to share its resources and platform with other movements and to become effective advocates for anti-racist and anti-colonial causes. In particular, our biggest fear with the Endowment Justice Coalition is that the fossil fuel divestment demand will become the dominant demand because it seems the most scary if you don't know anything about any of our causes. You know, the whole world's on fire. Everybody's going to be universally affected eventually. Um, and it's the most palatable and easily explainable to press. We've seen our activism reduced to just the fossil fuel divestment demand in press coverage. And we've also reached out to alumni with pledges not to donate to the university until our demands are met, only to have them respond that they're interested in our fossil fuel divestment demand, but not the Puerto Rican debt demand. And so we have to go a step beyond simply understanding the links between racism, colonialism, and climate change. Um, we've made it part of our messaging to um, use Puerto Rican debt um, and Hurricane Maria as an example of how these things are intertwined. Because in 2015, Puerto Rico said that it was incapable of paying off its debt. Now, um, now much of it is interest, which means it's accumulated over time. Um, and this was before Hurricane Maria, which was made much more severe and much more intense because of human induced climate change. And now the economic repercussions of Hurricane Maria are also made much more damaging because of that debt crisis that existed beforehand. And so we have to fight these things at once. We have to fight these power structures at once. And if 
like it's impossible to take away the social license of fossil fuel industries if you're not also dismantling the forces of oppression and racism that allowed those industries to rise to power and take hold over a society in the way that they do now. So it's, it's the difference between passively educating yourself and taking action in these causes. And we've been working on an ongoing solution in the Endowment Justice Coalition. We've created an outreach working group, which highlights ways to get involved in other movements. And it communicates with other groups on and off campus, um, off campus because it's so important to reach out to our neighbors. Um, I've grown up in New Haven and now I go to Yale and that's the surrounding city. And I, I just think it's, like absolutely vital, um, especially if your university has a history of exploitation with the community around you, um, to team up with your neighbors because they are fighting, like many of them, the activists in that city have been fighting the same power structures in your university that you're fighting now. Um, and you have to take your cue from them. And so our goal is to offer support as frequently as, or more often than we ask for support on our own campaigns. What's really key is to reach out consistently um, and not just when you need support on a demonstration or on a campaign, because you're not necessarily doing an organization any favors by just sending them opportunities to get involved in your own projects. So to build an actual mutual partnership with an organization, you have to attend their meetings and you have to frame outreach with the approach of how can we help? How can we be of use? Thank you, Fee. Those are some really great tips. and. I'm really excited to see where uh, the Yale Endowment Justice Coalition leads to. So um, as you kind of made it made clear, often it takes more than student support alone to gain the attention of decision makers. So in divestment organizing, Layla, could you elaborate on some of the methods of direct action that you were able to engage in on campus? Definitely. Um, so we planned a lot of nonviolent protests, uh, interactive sit-ins in which people could learn Debke, which is the traditional Palestinian Eastern dance, um, learn how to drum the Palestinian, um, traditional Palestinian drum, or engage in conversations about Palestinian culture and politics. So our goals with that was to kind of humanize the Palestinian movement and say, look, these are people with a culture. These are people with a life and, and a history, um, learn about it and engage in it. And maybe you'll care a little bit more. Um, but one of the main um, actions that we took was um, to pass the pro BDS resolution on campus, which would push UO to boycott and divest from Israeli companies that are produ that produce um, uh, that that use production or <laughs> that are produced in illegal settlements. Um, and a few of those companies are Caterpillar, Motorola, Sabra Hummus, SodaStream. These are all made in illegal settlements in the West Bank. Um, so really our goal was to just boycott these companies um, and cultural institutions in Israel. And so we teamed up with groups on campus such as Jews Against Occupation and um, Muslim Student Union um, and presented in front of the UO Senate, uh, which we didn't think would get a lot of pushback. We didn't think there would be that much of a response, but we were met with very intimidating groups of uh, frat members and sorority members um, and J Street members who avidly opposed the BDS resolution, saying that it was erasing their identity and their struggles against anti-Semitism. And in my experience, once the word anti-Semitism is used or is brought up, the conversation ends, it's cut off. Um, and unfortunately being anti-Israeli government um, and establishment is conflated with being anti-Jewish, um, which it, as a group, when we're fighting for human rights, um, the intention is not to slash those of another. We are here to elevate those of people who have not had rights. They don't, they are completely treated unequally. Um, and so it's pretty frustrating because in their eyes, allowing Palestinians to live peacefully meant that their existence as Israelis or even Jews in America was threatened. And that was not the intention at all. So a lot of our engagement on campus was just blanketed as being anti-Semitic. Um, which makes it really, really, really difficult to get anywhere. Um, because of course, we are not 
trying to be anti-Semitic. We are not against Jewish people living. We are not against, at this point, we're not against even the, Isra the state of Israel existing. Um, because we know that, that that's not possible, but we are just trying to create an equal existence for Palestinians and Israelis. Um, yeah, so I digress, but it all of our efforts on campus seem to be met with the same resistance that all pro-Palestinian groups meet or are met with. Um, and yeah, so that was just our experience. And we tried our best to kind of humanize the whole experience of Palestinians and the BDS movement, but it wasn't met that with open arms, let's say. Thank you, Layla, for sharing your experiences. And Fee, you were discussing uh, the unique elements of the campus environment. And one of those is obviously the limited time period that students are in college. So in light of the quick student turnover on campuses, how do you engage in recruitment and training to ensure long lasting movements? Yeah, yeah, that's so true because the nature of a university itself is such that it's like you're almost designed to forget what the people before you fought for because you, you were only there for four years or maybe, maybe a few more. Um, but we have to find ways to peacefully reject that. We have to find ways to create a decades long collective memory between student activists, or we're never going to be able to draw on the movements of people who came before us. And so what we do at the Adama Justice Coalition is once a year, we have an annual retreat where we engage in storytelling and movement building and skill sharing. And it's really fun, but it's also really, really productive. Um, storytelling is so crucial. Um, for anyone looking to start a university divestment campaign. It's been around for student activists at my university since the Black Panther trials in New Haven. That was when students defied our administration to house members of the Black Panther Party in their dorms. And those activists inspired the apartheid divestment activists of the 1980s. In 1986, um, they occupied our library's plaza in a shanty town for a year and risked arrest and suspension. And now our university honors their efforts um, and those activists passed on over the years through storytelling their values of non-hierarchy and radical love and inclusion. And as our movement grows and evolves, we hope to inspire future generations that are just four years long and pass on those skills and those resources as well. Um, we know from storytelling that occupation works um, because, you know, Yale eventually divested from apartheid, as did other universities across the nation. And so we're wondering if maybe in 20 years, there will be a plaque at our football stadium honoring our arrest at the Harvard Yale football game. There might be, um, if history is circular enough. Uh, at, in addition to storytelling, we also use the retreats to build power maps, to theorize about our ideals and strategy. And that type of movement building is not the time for practicality. I recommend getting like as big and as idealistic as you can with your visions of anti-capitalism and equity. It's also a time to care for each other to teach each other protest music. Um, I love being a song leader and it's so much fun um, to lead music at retreats and pass that on as well. And it's also important that your zines and your power maps and your artwork and everything that you make during this time live forever in a shared Google Drive folder or something that's accessible to all for future four-year generations. We try to bring in Endowment Justice alumni as well because many of them have stayed consistently involved with our campaigns, so they love to tell us stories and to advise us. And we're also constantly organizing one-on-ones to recruit new members to share skills like effective research and medical coordination of all our different tasks. Um, I ultimately think that recruiting and educating new people is just as important to combat student turnover as remembering the past, because you have to kind of think non-linearly and live non-linearly and let both the past and the future inform your action strategy. Thanks, Fee. That's really great insight. And for the next question, um, Layla, I know you mentioned that these campaigns can stir up a lot of polarized opinions and opposition on campus. So in the case of pushback from people on campus, um, how would you advise uh, responding and framing your campaign narrative accordingly? Yeah, so 
throughout the whole the whole process of um, of pro BDS super movement, we received a lot of pushback from people on campus, especially UO president President Schill. He he has given us the most pushback of anyone and has used his Jewish identity to, to act as though he's threatened by us trying to pass this resolution. Um, we received pushback from the liberal group J Street, um, from Bratz and Sororities, like I'd said before, from the Republicans on campus, um, from just normal people on the street. So we realized that if we frame it as an Israeli issue or as a Jewish issue, it wouldn't be taken well because people react poorly when they feel that their identity is being challenged. Um, and as a side note, that is one thing that Israel has done really well. It's made Jewish Americans feel a very deep connection to Israel, even if they haven't stepped foot on the land um, or have very little connection to their Jewish heritage, which is just another way that um, Palestinian identity is erased. But anyway, we found it most effective to frame it as a human rights issue. Um, most people can agree on basic human rights. People deserve to live in a safe environment. People deserve to have access to food and water and social security and jobs. Um, and we tried to humanize the Palestinian struggles, such as pointing out that in Gaza, 95% of fresh water is toxic. Um, they only have access to four hours of electricity a day, or that in the West Bank, people are, are have to pass through checkpoints with armed soldiers that are ready to shoot and kill, or frequent home demolitions. Children are being arrested frequently. Um, and in the past two months since coronavirus has started, there have been 300 arrests of children, that is Palestinians under the age of 18 that have been arrested. So this is not just an issue of Palestine versus Israel, of Jewish versus Muslim. This is an issue of, of human rights. Um, and so we, we had the most success when we framed it in that way. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's not a movement of trying to erase Jewish identity because we can all acknowledge that Jews have gone through an unbearable amount of pain. But what we can also acknowledge, which does not erase the Jewish history or does not erase Jewish identity, is that Palestinians are going through something similar and have been for the past 70 plus years. And so in our attempt to humanize it, we once again are painted as being anti-Semitic. And my goal with with being a, an activist, being a Palestinian activist, my goal is to draw the lines and say, listen, these are issues that are happening everywhere. And you, of all people, Israelis, should know that. Um, so yeah, I think in any circumstance, humanizing or just focusing on the human rights issues and climate change, people are being affected by this. It, they're not governments, they are not numbers, they are not statistics, they are people. So it's, I think that is step number one in trying to get people on your side is just creating a story and creating a narrative. Um, and that's the most effective way that, that I've, I've felt to get my point across. Thanks, Layla. I think that is some really, really, really insightful advice that applies to a lot of other movements too. Um, just this idea of broadening uh, the perspective to um, really make the issue more universal. I feel like that could apply to um, weapons, manufacturer divestment campaigns, private prison divestment campaigns. And um, so thank you for sharing your experiences. And um, Layla, I know you were also able to pass a BDS resolution on your campus. So I'm wondering, Fee, do you have any experience working with your student government for divestment at Yale? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, this year, something exciting actually just happened uh, relating to student government. Um, our college council has unanimously voted to support our demands of fossil fuel divestment and cancellation of holdings in Puerto Rican debt. And that means they also officially became a member of the Endowment Justice Coalition. We've even had the wonderful president of the college council joining us in meetings, which is really cool. Um, and we had to do a little bit of reevaluating as a coalition. You know, I saw um, I would meet people in a meeting and then next week they'd be across the bench from me asking me questions um, as part of the disciplinary committee, which was honestly really cool to know that we had allies everywhere and that like our support was growing. Um, 
but it was fascinating to interact with and to welcome people from student government into the coalition because the environment that they're familiar with and that they thrive in is highly structured um, and it has these tiers of leadership and we have a non-hierarchical just absolutely wild horizontal organizing structure um, where projects just get completed through voluntary task delegation and we all trust each other and we all have to rely on each other equally for guidance um, and the non-hierarchical model has its own drawbacks too um, but somehow I've found that we managed to get more done than lots of the more organized and tiered student organizations that I'm a part of because we're all just so invested. Invested is a bad word, but we're all so passionate um, about the work that we do that the work gets done and we're all willing to share our skills and our resources with each other. And because anybody can just step up regardless of prior involvement and learn a skill or get involved in something they haven't done before, kind of the possibilities are endless and there's so much more people power to get stuff done. Um, so it's only when we bring in folks from student government that we appreciate that non-hierarchy for that non-hierarchy for how accessible it is. Um, we found it helpful to explain our structure and our meeting norms at the beginning of every meeting. And now we do that at every single meeting because it's good to orient new members and it's also good to ground returning members in our own philosophy. Our meeting norms include a rotating facilitator or two who guides us through the collectively built agenda. Um, and we make sure that that facilitator rotates so that it doesn't seem like there's any one leader um, or any five leaders. And we have kind of like the antithesis of Robert's rules, um, which is maybe what the people from student government are used to, like language, like motion to adjourn. Um, but we, you know, if we have a new point, we go like this. And if we want to build off of what somebody's saying, we go like this. Um, and this is a moral veto. Um, we also have the jargon giraffe, which is really fun. If you don't understand a term or if you want an explanation about context, we use the jargon giraffe. So it was just, it was really disorienting to a lot of student government people, but we love them and we're so glad um, that they're part of the coalition now. Awesome, wow. I'm very excited to see how uh, your collaboration goes. And um, I'm also curious if the current pandemic has been affecting, well, I know it's been affecting the organizing. So I'm curious um, how the current pandemic is influencing your campus organizing and what are some ideas for adjusting um, divestment campaigns accordingly? Yeah, organizing in the pandemic is like tough and unprecedented and none of us have dealt with it before, um, but it's possible, you know? It's, it's possible and it requires like a level of empathy and care and love that we knew we needed before all of this happened, that we grounded our activism in beforehand. So it's really activists who are the most prepared to engage in mutual aid and to care for each other now. Um, we are having so many Zoom meetings every single week and that presents an issue because it's a pandemic and not everyone has the time and capacity or even the literal bandwidth, bandwidth of the Wi-Fi in their house to come to our Zoom meetings. Um, many college students are caring for siblings or older family members. Some have taken on new jobs as essential workers. Some are in very different time zones and some households are struggling to get by with layoffs and the economic impacts of the pandemic. And some people have been sick with COVID-19 themselves. In the coalition, we've had folks get sick, but we always record our meetings for folks in different time zones. And we always take care of each other with one-on-ones and calls to check in. And I hope you know that that never stops, even if we fully get back to normal. We start every meeting now with a roundtable update on how everybody's doing physically, mentally, emotionally, and that's been really helpful. Um, I also hope that that continues. But it's not just the methods of organizing that need to change. We also have to change the content and the goals of our organizing because we're in an emergency. And it's okay to acknowledge that and to redirect our energy to support our communities. So we have partially reoriented the Endowment Justice Coalition to facilitate mutual aid efforts, both local ones for folks here in New Haven, Connecticut, and remote ones for people far away. Um, and we've been advocating for our university to use its own wealth to better support the surrounding communities. And that's part of a newly emerging campaign called Step Up Yale, which makes three demands of our university to repurpose its facilities, to provide housing and food for our neighbors without shelter during quarantine, to stop custodial arrests by our campus police, and to stop rent collection on Yale owned properties for the duration of the pandemic because they own about 500 residential properties in New Haven. 
And we're still um, also holding direct actions regarding this campaign and demonstrations. So in a pandemic, direct action has to be modified um, to accommodate spatial distancing measures. You might have seen the footage of car honking protests online, which are so cool and I love them, um, but they don't suit university students very well because most of us don't have cars and most of us are quarantining far from our universities. So we have to be creative. And one of our most recent actions actually consisted of locally based students taking photos alone by the university gates um, with face masks and with signs that said empty shelter here. We paired that with a social media campaign, which allowed everybody to participate in the circulation and the escalation of our cause, regardless of how far away they were. And we're also holding a teach-in, which it makes me so happy that teach-ins are still possible, but they are. Um, the Yale Endowment Justice Coalition is holding a teach-in this Thursday, and it's titled, What Does a Just Yale Look Like? And if anybody in the webinar is in the New Haven area, affiliated with Yale, or just interested in learning um, about Yale's tax evasion and history of exploiting the city and wealth hoarding um, and all that good stuff. I can send a link to the chat um, about our teaching, unless somebody already has. Somebody already has, thank you so much, Carly. Yeah, so that's taking place this, thir this Thursday and it's the first of its kind for us. We've never done a virtual teaching before. Um, it's the first digital adaptation of this model that we're now quite accustomed to. So we have to try, especially in wild and dire circumstances like these. And ultimately, I just, I have so much optimism, which I know is a weird thing to say because everything is falling apart. Um, but the fact that we're continuing, right? The fact that we're still organizing and adapting our methods shows how much resilience we have and how much we can do when we care for each other. Awesome, thank you, Fee. Those are some really awesome next steps. And I'm really glad we're able to continue organizing at this time. And to all of our viewers out there, if you're interested in starting your own campaign, like the ones you heard about today, our team at Code Pink is here to support you. And I personally would love to help you get started. If you're interested, you can send me an email at kelsey at codepink.org. And also make sure to check out our newly released university divestment guide because that will also help you walk through the process. And um, we are putting a link to the university divestment guide in the Zoom chat, but you can also find it on our website. And so now it's time for us to open up the discussion to our Q&A session with our audience members. And as a reminder, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box. And Cody will be facilitating our Q&A session. So Cody, do you want to take it away? Will do. Thanks, Kelsey. And thanks so much to Fee and Layla for such a great panel. Everyone give a big muted round of applause for our two panelists. Um, I'm going to walk through some of the questions that were raised during the webinar. It was actually cool seeing how there was already sort of a chat discussion going on. Um, but I wanted to pose these questions to our panelists. Um, one question our first came from Chuck. That is, has, the, has BDS been successful in divestment at the university level yet? What seems most promising currently? So I think that could be applied to any particular university um, or, or the general uh, university movement as a whole. Yeah, definitely. So I think the way to look at its success is it is an international organization, um, but you can also look at the fear that Israel and the U.S. has. So they have pushed back. They have silenced. They, 26 states out of 50 in the U.S. have um, passed anti-BDS legislation, meaning that you need to sign a contract before you uh, get a job in one of those states, before you speak at a university, at a public university there. Um, so they're passing all this legislation and all these policies that are anti-BDS. So that means that something is working. Um, it is raising awareness to an unprecedented level that we, have, we haven't seen before. Um, and the fact that it is as widespread as it has become is very indicative of its success. Um, so although specifically at U of O, it, uh, 
uh, BDS initially passed the resolution. It wasn't passed um, after the Senate, which was unfortunate, but it is still successful um, at university campuses. I mean, most university campuses have some form of Students for Justice in Palestine or super or pro BDS um, student group. So yeah, I think, I think there aren't like specific things that you can point to to say, yes, it's been successful or no, it hasn't. But I think that you can look at its response from Israel and its response from the people that it is targeting or the groups that it is targeting and realize that it's doing its job. Um, and it's making people realize that there are major injustices happening that the US is very, very, very involved in. I mean, $10 million of military aid goes to Israel every single day. So just the fact that we're even having the seminar and I'm able to talk about BDS, I think speaks on its success. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's been very successful, if that answers your question, sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Leila. Uh, we're coming up on time, so I'm going to keep on going through and I'm going to pose this next question to Fee first. Um, I'll put this question from Fahim. I'll repost it in the chat. It's a bit of a longer one, um, but it's regarding divestment from fossil fuels. Has it been easier to sell on campuses without technical programs or in states that do not have fossil fuel investments already? or is the existence or non-existence of these technical programs um, in a state with significant investments, does that have an impact? This is such an excellent question and I wish I could speak to it, but I don't know if I can compare um, different universities' levels of success with fossil fuel divestment since I only have experience with my own. Um, but it's a really good question. And my guess is probably that I guess, depending on a university's relationship to the state, it would have um, an influence on, yeah, on the success of a fossil fuel divestment movement if it's surrounding, surrounding city, surrounding government is also tied to the same fossil fuel industries. Yeah, if anybody else wants to share, you can. Awesome, and would totally open that up to um, other members of World Beyond War or, or Code Pink um, here to see if uh, this question about technical programs around fossil fuel divestment has come up in y'all's work. Um, but if not, uh, I could also move right along. Thank you so much, Fee, for answering the question. Um, the next question uh, was related to um, university divestment from nuclear weapons. Um, and I know we, um, big shout out, we had uh, Susie Snyder from Don't Bank on the Bomb on our second webinar, uh, which you can see on our uh, YouTube channel, uh, talking about divestment research. Um, so that's definitely an organization that um, I know we'd like to um, prop out there. Um, but wanted to pose it to both Fee and Layla in uh, your divestment work on campus. Um, have you maybe done coalition building with any um, divestment work around nuclear weapons? I personally haven't. Um, so maybe Fee, you should take this one. Me neither, unfortunately. It's such a good question though. And we're always looking to expand um, our reach of divestment campaigns. We're always finding new information about our university's dirty money. There's so much out there. Um, I will pose uh, the question um, to Dalit, uh, who sent me a message saying she could uh, respond. Um, so I'm not sure if Dalit will be able to mute or unmute uh, themselves. Oh, great. Somebody unmuted me. Thank you. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I didn't run a divestment campaign uh, specifically on nuclear weapons, but uh, as for the previous question about when is it easier, I think it has a lot to do with the definition of success. Uh, with many of the BDS campaigns that we've been running, 
The success was passing a student resolution, and in none of the colleges did the university itself divest. Uh, so it has a symbolic value. And when you run a symbolic campaign, and which, which has a huge impact, the symbolics is important. When you run a symbolic campaign, it really doesn't matter what the university is or isn't invested in. That's the, that's the truth. When you want the resolution to actually be, be implemented, then it, it makes a huge difference. It really does, because uh, the university administration will not pass a decision to implement without the buy-in from their investment staff. And so they need to actually support it and, and be reassured that it will not have a, a detrimental effect on the returns. And many times when you run a campaign and when we have run campaigns that also ask for implementation, what we did was to run an inside outside strategy. So the outside strategy is putting pressure on the administration using the student senate, using uh, a faculty senate using you know direct action whatever we can and at the same time running a more quiet internal campaign trying to influence decision makers usually in a very different language uh, reaching to them through professionals trying to convince them that this will not be very expensive for them uh, that they can actually do that easily that they don't need to put in a lot of research um, so i don't know if i answered your question but that's what i know Excellent. Thank you so much, Dalit from American Friends Service Committee. Um, and Dalit will be speaking on our final webinar next week too. So please plug in to hear more of Dalit's lessons. <laughs> um, I think we're coming up on time, but uh, I know one question I wanted to pose to both of you. Um, this goes a bit more into the, uh, the coalition building, but I think both of you spoke about um, like what it was like to organize with student, uh, with student government, um, some of the faculty that would support or would not support. I'm wondering if you could talk more about, have any of your organizing united with say, like campus workers? And, Cause I know that that's another big struggle on campuses is um, for workers' rights. And I'm wondering if in any of your divestment work, if you linked up with any of those workers' struggles on campus as well. I have like a tangentially relevant answer, so I can take that one um, unless Layla wants to. I guess we both can. Um, we haven't engaged with um, campus workers, but we have engaged with off campus unions. Um, and actually, just yesterday, um, yesterday was Monday. Oh my goodness. Um, yesterday, there was a Board of Alders meeting in our city, um, and members of the Endowment Justice Coalition testified along with people from Yale Fair, Yale Fair Share and New Haven Rising. Um, which are both off campus groups um, that have been at this for so long, um, trying to get Yale to pay taxes because currently our university would be paying $146 million in taxes per year um, if they did, but they don't. Um, and so tax evasion, I think, is like so, so, so critical and also so easy to criticize in a moment of emergency like a pandemic that it's maybe. Um, more effective for us to seize on that than to seize on divestment right now um, as a way to save lives um, of the people who are right here in our community. We didn't pair up with uh, campus workers, although that would have been smart. Um, but again, it's just, it's a struggle against the man if, you know, <laughs> it's, we're all fighting for the same thing. We're all fighting to be treated equally and fighting for justice for each other. And um, so, yeah, I mean, you can draw parallels between any and all human rights groups, minimum wage workers, um, immigrant workers. It's, it's all the same struggle. But so I, I can't speak personally on building a coalition with them, but I see the connection, no doubt. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to everyone who asked questions. Um, thanks again, once again, <laughs> to both of our panelists today. We are coming up at our time for this webinar. So I'm gonna pass it off to Greta from World Beyond War to finish it, us up with some next steps.
Thanks, Cody. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for tonight's webinar on divesting universities. My name is Greta Zaro, and I'm the organizing director with World Beyond War. World Beyond War and Code Pink have been putting together this five-week divestment webinar series. And next week is the last webinar in this five-week series on Tuesday, May 19th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll be concluding this series with talking about coalition building, which we've touched on a little bit tonight, but we'll be expanding that with a one hour discussion really talking about how you can build an intersectional campaign and draw these cross connections between issues using divestment as a tactic that brings them all together. So we will put the links in the chat uh, for the next webinar so you can register. Uh, we'll also be sending a follow up email to all of the registrants with the recording link from tonight's webinar and additional resources and other ways that you can get involved. So I think that's everything for now, but we hope to see you next week. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been great. Goodbye, have a good night. Bye, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Peace and love. <laughs>